If you found out today, just at a normal doctor checkup, it turns out you only have five to 10 years left to live. What would you change about your life? I want the freedom to be with who I want to be with and to be doing things I find value in. The real value of Bitcoin has to go up to the detriment of other assets. People are gonna retire at 36 and be like, all right, I don't have to work anymore. They're gonna go start backpacking in Thailand. And they're gonna get there and after two months realize like, well, I guess that was cool, but I'm sort of bored now. And my goodness, I don't have anyone to share this with. If you went to the doctor for a routine checkup and you found out that you only have 24 hours left to live, thinking about the finality of that moment, what did you miss? I had a client a few weeks ago call and let me know that their husband passed away. Um, he's he's 41 and she's 34 and they have a three-year-old. This is a family I've worked with for about five years now and uh, not remotely expected. Um, and that night she called me is about nine o'clock and I was working that night and I had to work for a few more hours. Then I went home and I just read my notes from our conversations for the last five years. And um, that is very in my mind. Like that can happen. That's real. Um, it's, it's funny when you have a Bitcoin podcast, but a, you, you rarely have an actually licensed financial plan on the show. Like that's like rarely happens. I think like if like two or three that actually have this CPR and CFR, I don't know the, the whole titles, but, uh, use, use something like that. Right. Yes. Uh, well, the, the reason it's rare is because, uh, there's not many of us. Um, I think I'm friends with basically every financial planner out there who uh, understands and advocates for Bitcoin. Um, and yeah, there's like there's like six of us, uh, at least in the US. Um, so yeah, we we are the anomaly. Amazing. Uh, what, what does it make so so difficult to, to be a financial planner and in Bitcoin? Is it like, are you learning a lot of fear in there? Um, I would say because up until recently, I would say now it's becoming more better from the from the bitcoiner side of things um but for the last several years the hard part is has been i've had i have regularly have stones thrown at me from both camps so the uh the traditional finance people think i'm an idiot um you know they think that, that the fact that i own bitcoin and that I advocate for a client stone bitcoin is absolutely insane and that i'm i'm a total moron and wrong um so i get that from from that side of things. That's one camp I leave. I live deeply in finance and personal finance. I love that side. But then from the Bitcoin side of things, I also uh, get stones thrown my way for talking about like, you should have a US dollar emergency fund. And like, maybe you should diversify and maybe not maybe, maybe it doesn't make sense for everyone to have 100% of allocation in Bitcoin. And it's like, Oh, like that guy, that guy's a bear. It's like, all right, so I, I can't satisfy anybody. Um, that, I guess that's what it's when it's hard. And I would say that over the last few years, let's say probably like three or four years ago, um, I took a lot more flack from the Bitcoin community for being a financial planner. Um, I think like last having cycle, I felt like there was this, this hype race. It was like, who can have the most hype and have the biggest price prediction? Who can be the biggest bull for Bitcoin? And the, the larger your price prediction for the having cycle, the more respect you were in the community. And if you said that you only thought the Bitcoin was going to go to X and some guy said it was X times two, like suddenly you didn't like Bitcoin. Um, I, I'm hoping to see that reduced. Not that I don't like Bitcoin, but like, yeah, that's, I, I, I'm not, I'm not getting as much criticism from the Bitcoin side. Maybe, uh, maybe I've just become thicker skin though. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's so funny because I put thumbnails together and stuff like that. So I know uh, people think like I put the price in the, in every thumbnail, but I look at the data. I'm like, oh, like I put like the thumb uh, the price rarely in there. Like maybe like every uh, every tenth or every twentieth episode. But the thing is, people click on that, so they see it all the time in their feeds. Uh, so that's definitely people are really uh, focused on the on the US dollar price on that. Um, I'm really curious also, um, when you look at the average Bitcoiner you've spoken with a lot, what, what can they learn uh, from financial planning perspective? What is the, the, the most, the, the biggest uh, mistake you think uh, Bitcoiners are making? I can take this lots of directions. Um, of course, I could, I could speak to the technical side of integrating Bitcoin to a financial plan and talk about tax planning and estate planning and like the prob the high probability that my guess is the average Bitcoiner right now is like a 37 year old male. Um, and, you know, in Satoshi's words, those lost Bitcoin will be, uh, you know, uh, um, 
uh, what is the words? Anyways, there will be donations to other Bitcoin holders. So those lost Bitcoin. And there will be some, the average Bitcoin, again, called a 37-year-old male. Some of those will pr die prematurely and they didn't have a plan. And uh, they, their wife or spouse will not know how to access that. So like, I could speak to that. We could speak to the tax planning. We could talk to I don't know, lots of things. Um, but the two things that immediately come to mind, as far as what, like, those are important. But I'd say the two most important things that I think are neglected would be, uh, uh, well, okay, you asked for one. I would say it is the alignment of your money with your family and what you value. Now, I, I, okay, I'm going to cheat. I'm, I'm, I'm lumping, the, lumping those two together. So one, what role does Bitcoin actually play in your life? If it's Bitcoin, if it's US dollars, if it's stocks, if it's whatever, what role does that actually play? Bitcoin itself is not the end. Bitcoin is money. And money is a tool to help you do what's important to you in life. So have you actually identified what it is that you value and the role that that has? Or is your end game to actually just stack as much Bitcoin as possible? Maybe that is your goal. I, I don't know. That seems like a, a strange goal. Even if you're doing that, you're doing it maybe for a future generation. So your end goal is to actually impact your future generation, not as much as Bitcoin as possible. So anyways, that's problem one, is the lack of articulation of what the money is there for. And then step two, uh, the, the second biggest issue that there's, uh, I run into all the time is, again, going back to, in my experience, the average demographic of Bitcoiners is usually men. Um, so I very regularly run into people reaching out, Hey Jim, um, I have fallen down the Bitcoin rabbit hole over the last X amount of years. Um, my wife hears me talk about it all the time and either like at best she, uh, she willingly tags along and allocates to it, or she begrudgingly tags along, uh, and lets me buy it, or she is hostile to it. And it really is a point of contention in our marriage. Um, that that is a huge thing I run into all the time, and it's a, it's this alignment, and that's what those those two conversations I just mentioned. They marry together well if you can if you can uh, navigate them properly. It's interesting how much uh, of uh, finance is uh, just playing in the head, like mentally, just like an emotional thing and discipline uh, stuff. Like it's it's just like aligning your values, like just looking in the future and and doing that. It's it's, it's really interesting for me. Um, what do you mean with uh, aligning money to your values? Do, do you mean with like this goal setting and and going in there with like or like what do you really want to do with your money? So like, what's your goal with it? Yes. So well, so money. Money is a means of communication. It, it, how you use or don't use your money is a means of you communicating what's important to you. So at least in the US, money is every year the number one cause of divorce. And the reason we see that a lot is, well, again, it, it communicates values. But especially if you say like, hey, uh, Robin, it's really important that um, – um, I know that you feel secure and that we're able to, or I tell my wife, Hey, I was going to use your example, but I'm not going to take you, take you on a date. So I tell my wife, her name's Kendra. Kendra's right here behind me. Um, uh, so, Hey, Kendra, I really want to make sure that you and I go on a date night once a week. Um, and I want to do these things for you, but if I'm not using my money and my time to demonstrate that she is a priority to me, there'll start to be angst there. My words can say that I value something, but the use of my money uh, can be counter to that. And that's where you start seeing a lot of pull. Um, uh, it's like, Hey, you said, you said that it's important that you're able to spend time with your family, but, uh, you spend a lot of time at work and trying to accumulate things. So your lifestyle is showing that having money and working a lot is actually more important than time with your family. Um, so money, how you use it or don't use it, um, again, communicates what's important to you. So, that is, you have to recognize that first. And that's where, that's where money can be so contentious is people not recognizing that their money habits are misaligned with what they tell their spouse or people in their lives, what they value or heck, even acknowledging to themselves, oh, I really want to make sure that I'm financially secure and um, would love to not have to work forever. Yet the way they use their money does not actually uh, pair well with what they're saying. There's an interesting study I, I read about a few years ago. Um, 
I don't know the sciencey stuff behind it. Basically, these uh, uh, these guys hook things on people's heads that could read your brain waves. Okay, and they had them. They would tell them stories. So they would tell a story like Robin. Um, this happens to you. You're in a car wreck and you're par paralyzed. And then they would tell a euphoric story. Robin, this happens and it's a great thing. And then they would tell a story about a stranger. Hey, this stranger got in a car wreck and this thing happened. And then Robin, in 50 years, this thing happens to you. So they would tell those different stories and read how your brain monitored or registered those. And what they found was, if I told a story to you about your present, uh, a hypothetical that happens, it would register in one part of your brain. If I tell Robin a story about a stranger, it would register in a different part of your brain. You felt bad for the person who got in a car wreck, but it wasn't you. And then if I told Robin a story about Robin in 50 years, it registered in the stranger part side of your brain, not you side of brain. So it's really hard. A lot of times people have a very difficult time recognizing that future them is still them. Um, so again, that comes back with this aligning of like, all right, is what I'm doing now actually aligning with what I say I value? That could be today, that could be in 50 years. Um, and then uh, as far as the goal sides of things, um, yes, that's obviously that's that's really important. I would say a a risk of starting with goals is goals can be very arbitrary. And goals will change. So, Robin, if I said to you, like, "Hey, Robin, like, what uh, what are your what are your big financial goals that you have right now? What are things you want to do and have?" That we're apt to probably, in my experience, most people will start shouting out things that they have heard. They're regurgitating things that they think should be goals. Well, I want to do this, this, and this, and I guess I want to retire at X and whatever. And they're just saying them from a surface level, or again, regurgitating things that they've other heard people say are goals you should have. So what's more important than starting with goals is starting with what is the underlying theme of what you value, both individually and personally, and then as a family. Um, what what is important? What what informs those goals? And once you've articulated that, then we can move into the goals associated with that value. Um, recognizing that the goals themselves are going to change. You know, it's like I want to make sure that um, I retire at fifty one. That's a goal. Well, you can get to 51 and realize like, wow, I actually love what I do. I want to retire when I'm 60 now. But you realize then that the goal wasn't retiring at 51. The goal was not going to a job that you dislike starting at 51. And once you get there, the goalpost has moved because suddenly you're not going to a job that you dislike at 51. You're doing it. You reached your goal, but you didn't reach your stated goal. You reached the underlying value. So it's an articulation of what is really important to me and then finding associated goals and once we've articulated what you value, what those goals are, then assessing, okay, here's the trade-offs and decisions and implications. If I choose to pursue X, I am deliberately or not deliberately giving up on Y and recognizing that those trade-offs. Um, that's super important. Like if you're going to put all your money into Bitcoin, you're sacrificing something else. If it's your wife's peace of mind um, or if it's delaying gratification for a vacation you want to go on or whatever it is, you, know, you are sacrificing for that. And where does that come in? Those trade-offs and opportunity cost. And once you've navigated those things well, then you can finally start taking action. And at that point, the taking action is pretty simple because you've identified these other things. And again, most people, unfortunately, just start, you know, it's like, well, I don't, I, I can't afford to save because they haven't even thought about why they want to save. They, they are, they're still thinking about future, future them as a stranger. Um, or it's like, hey, I have an extra thousand dollars a month that I can't start saving, and they just arbitrarily put it somewhere. It's because they have not identified well what's important to me, both now and down the line. Um, you know, a, a financial plan is is a is telling your money, here's where we're going to go because I want you to do this, both now and down the line. Um, and it comes, it, it has to be intentional and deliberate. So, sorry, that was a really long answer to or uh, to a short question. <laughs> I, I love that. I love that. I, it's always like when, when the guest rants, uh, uh, that, that's usually the, the best part of it. Um, retiring is a really interesting um, subject. I know it's super, super popular in Bitcoin. I think a lot of Bitcoiners are also looking for Bitcoin as a retirement means. Uh, one thing that just came up in my mind when you're talking and, and, and uh, what I have uh, goals, I always had the goal of maximizing my um, 
time where I don't have to work and still be fine. Like I always like measured my net worth of like, okay, how many months, how many years could I now basically live uh, without me having any income? That that was uh, a previous to my podcast, my like definition of like, what's my net worth actually. I never calculated in Bitcoin or in, in US dollars. I always made this uh, a calculation of like, okay, how much wealth do I have? Uh, what's it's my running cost? Uh, how will it develop? Uh, what's probably my, my months of or years that I have? Uh, since I started the podcast, I kind of thought a little bit different because now I actually do something that I like. I actually do something that I really enjoy. And then I'm like, I don't, I, I, even if I, uh, if someone is like, oh, I will give you a million each, each month, I, I would not stop it. Uh, maybe I would outsource uh, uh, taxes a little bit more because I don't like bookkeeping and taxes too much. Maybe I would outsource some other parts of it, but most of it actually, uh, 90% I already like. So I think like retiring, most people just don't want that job. To, like most people just don't uh, dislike the job when they really want to. I retire is that a is that a wrong assumption yeah i found it's typically people are not looking to retire per se it is i wish i had more time to be with the people i care about and be doing something that i value and sometimes that means being retired but a lot of times that's not, hey, like, you know, for the longest time, at least in the US, there's this like generational thing for like baby boomers, I guess. You work your job for 40 years, you retire at 66, you get your pension, and uh, you go down to Florida a couple times a year and you play shuffleboard. You do that till you're 73 and then you're too tired to go down there anymore. And then you stay at home and you, you go eat at Golden Corral or some sort of buffet and then you die. Um, and I, people, I think some people are starting to realize like that sort of stinks. Um, I don't want to wait to do these things until I'm 67. And, uh, so it's not this end goal of retiring. It is, I want the freedom to be with who I want to be with and to be doing things that I, I find value in. If I could do that, working is not the issue. It's those, it's the autonomy and freedom. So yeah, you can pursue, you can pursue retirement, um, but still be empty. I think there's a lot of people who pursue fire, you know, uh, the fire movement, financial independence, retire early. I think a huge risk in these people who are pursuing fire at all costs, a lot of these people are going to work a whole lot in their twenties and early thirties, and they're going to stiff arm everything in their life that they should be inviting in and not, not everything, but like uh, close relationships and depth and just like investing in things and people that it, again, it comes, there's opportunity cost. If you're going to work a whole bunch and like do all these things, so you can retire when you're 36, that has to come at some end to, to some cost. Okay. So I think a lot of these people are going to retire at 36 and be like, all right, I don't have to work anymore. They're going to go start backpacking in Thailand. And they're going to get there. And after two months realize like, well, I guess that was cool, but I'm sort of bored now. And my goodness, I don't have anyone to share this with. Like, that's pretty lame. Um, would you rather have retirement at 36, but you just missed out on all these things? Or would you rather have fulfillment in relationships, but have to work till you're 61? Like, again, we're not looking to not have to work. We're looking for flexibility and freedom uh, to do what's, what you value. And that can mean, I mean, if, if I said retirement is my ultimate goal and having money was my ultimate goal, I, I have four young kids. So if, if, if money and all that was my ultimate goal, I would just work 90 hours a week because I, 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 own, I own my own business. I could just work a whole lot and bring on more clients. But money in retirement is not the goal. It's, of course, I want money, but that way I can spend time with and have impactful time with my family and be able to be generous with our money. So I have to recognize that, yes, money helps with those things, but it's not the, it's the means to an end. Um, so if having money so I can spend time with my family is really important, that means it would be crazy foolish of me to say, and my oldest son, his name's Atticus. Atticus just turned seven last week. It'd be really foolish for me to say, hey, Atticus, um, I need to work more. We'll hang out when you're 18 and I finally made have a net worth of 20 million. Then we can really hang out. By the time he's 18, he's like, forget you, dad. Where were you all my all my childhood? It's like, oh, I was doing this so we could have a great time now. Like, I just, I just wasted it all. Uh, it, it seems like... Uh, it you're almost more of a life coach than a financial planner then. <laughs> I, mean, that's, I mean, that's what money, 
uh Yes. What what we what I do is I live anywhere and everywhere that your life and your money intersect. And your life is a means of helping you uh, do what's the most important in your life in the most inf- efficient and effective way. That's what money helps you do. Um, but if you allow money to become that thing, uh, it can accidentally become the a massive detractor to those. Again, it can, it can sub- subvert what you're trying to get at. I, I don't I don't know Jeff Bezos, but let's say personally, you said, Hey, Jim, I have a crystal ball. And in 30 years, you'll be the world's richest person or the second richest person in the world. But hey, with that, you're going to be divorced from your wife. And I don't know, Jeff and his kids, I don't even know if Jeff has kids. Let's say, Hey, Jim, at that, though, you're going to be divorced, you'll, uh, and you won't have a good relationship with your kids. And say, ah, no, thanks. I don't want it. But somewhere along that line, Maybe, maybe Jeff would have that response in 1990 if you told him that. Maybe not. But let's say, let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say that, yeah, he would say, man, I'd rather have my wife than have a zillion dollars. He probably didn't say like, okay, I'll take it. It just came over time. He incrementally made decisions to say, well, money is more important than my wife. And you make that decision over and over again. That's what happens. Um, yeah. And I, I want to make sure people aren't doing that. Like I care about our clients money, obviously, but I care about them way more. And if I care about you, I'll obviously be, I'll obviously care about your money because your, your money is a means to help you do what you value. Um, it's a, yeah, it's, it's not just money. Like money is a resource. Your time is a resource, your relationships, your talents. Um, how do we make sure all of things, all these things are working cohesively for what's important to you? And again, like they, they, they come with opportunity costs. Like if you're, going after this for money, you might be pulling away from relationship, or you might be you're spending your time on one thing when it could be going to X. So it, it, yeah, it all feeds in together. Um, and you you have to start with articulating why, why are you doing this in the first place? And it cannot be a goal. Like, when I was younger, I had a goal of like wanting to own a private jet. Um, and then someone challenged me, like, why do you want a jet? That's a pain. I was like, Oh, it'd be awesome to not have to wait in line at TSA and all that junk. It was like, dude, you don't want a private jet, you want easier travel. It's like, well, yeah, I guess so, but that's the way. Like, no, that's the only way for easier travel is not to own a jet. There's other ways of doing it. So I had I had misappropriately assigned a goal because I did not understand what I actually wanted. And I think people do that all the time for a lot simpler things than jets. They do it for everything. And that leads to a lot of angst. Absolutely, yeah. I, it's uh, with, with more material things, you also have to care for those things. <laughs> you also have to do more with them. It's really interesting. Um, the, this, these two opposites of like this, this toxic hodling want to just like have more and more and more and more Bitcoin and, and don't want to spend on anything that gives you joy. And the other side of like, uh, always have a zero bank balance, always like living in the moment and don't think about the future at all. Like this is the kind of the two extremes that I'm seeing now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess I guess Bitcoiners are tending more towards the, 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 the hodling side of it uh, because of that. Um, let, let's say uh, one guy is on the, oh, I want to stack more, I want to hodl more. Um, how can you see once it's toxic and too much or like how do you decide of like, oh, it, it, it's fine, he's still living. Like how, how can you self uh, assess someone in the like, okay, is he is just obsessing now with having a bigger stack and uh, don't know where he's going and, and where is he's like, oh, it's, it's he's just planning for the future. And I guess also Bitcoin is influencing that a lot because then your time preference comes differently because you actually look in the future more. And you're like, oh, like I see this this goals of like Bitcoin will hit a million at 2030. So I guess I have to stack like a maniac till 2030. Yeah, man. Um, I'll tell two stories to try to answer that. Um, personally, again, so I have four young kids. They're, they're seven, five, three, and one. And like this past year we went on a family vacation and we spent a pretty good amount of money for, for our vacation. Um, and I could have not done that. And it wasn't because we went there and like stayed in the, the Ritz or something like that. It was just it's expensive to fly with four kids and rent a car and all it's just, it, it's expensive. Um, I could have not done that and save that whatever it was, seven, eight grand or whatever for to buy more Bitcoin. You know, and a year ago, I don't know what Bitcoin was a year ago. I don't know, it was probably around 43,000. I feel like it was there forever. Let's say it was 43, you know, in 
you know, that could now be, you know, 14 grand. It's like, oh, well, if I don't go on vacation now in a decade, I can take them on a great vacation or in, a, in, in 20 years, instead of that vacation, every year that we give up, we can just buy a house in the mountains. It's like, well, yeah, but you want to spend time with your family. Like, what are you trying to achieve? That's what I'm trying to get at. Like, what are you trying to achieve here? And is having as much Bitcoin the goal or is Bitcoin itself trying to serve something else? And this, so for instance, like one thing, one thing we do is we ask really hard questions that force you to be introspective again, both personally. And then if you're married as a, as a couple, um, and it pulls out from you those things that you really value. Um, uh, also we have our clients create what I call a statement of financial purpose. And that's basically a mission statement for your money. So a few years ago, I had a, a client, it was, I was cooking dinner. It was like nine o'clock at night. And he called us like, Hey Jim, um, the house for sale or the house down the street is for sale. Should we buy it? Can we afford it? And as we talked for a quick sec, I answered his question. Can we afford it? And I was like, yes, you can't afford it. You won't be able to afford this house in Wyoming as quickly because you're moving this other house. But like, yeah, you can. So way more importantly, like, why do you want to move three houses down? Like, are you nuts? Like moving is the worst thing ever. You know, um, why do you want to move three houses down? He said, oh, well, our, they live in Texas, as do I, where it's really hot. He said, well, the, the house, three houses down has a pool and our current home doesn't. And um, our kids, they had two young, two young girls, um, two daughters. And he said, our kids, whenever they hang out with their friends, they always go to their friends' houses because their friends all have pools. So we don't get to see them that often. But if we had a pool, it would be a really good one. And they would be more motivated to spend time here. And therefore, we would have more time to be around them. I was like, okay, give me 10 seconds. So I went and grabbed his statement of financial purpose. And I just read it off to him and just read that we desire financial independence so we can have time to make memories as a family. I was like, look, your daughters, they were at that point, they were uh, like 12 and 10, I want to say. It's like, look, your oldest is going to be out of the house in six years. And your house is going to be completely quiet in eight years. You didn't tell me the most important thing is to have as much money as possible or to be able to retire at 53. You said the ultimate goal for your money is to be able to make memories as a family. So yeah, you can afford the, you, you can afford the new house. And according to your standard, not mine, you should probably go buy it. Um, so we do that. I, uh, I had a client a few weeks ago call and let me know that their husband passed away. Um, she's, he's, he's 41 and she's 34 and they have a three-year-old. This is a family I've worked with for about five years now. And, uh, not remotely expected. Um, and that night she called me is about nine o'clock and I was working that night and I had to work for a few more hours. Then I went home and I just read my notes from our conversations for the last five years. And uh, reading through responses he had told me about things that he, so one of the questions I ask, um, one of them is if money was no longer a care or concern, what would you do with your life? And another question is if you find out that if you found out today, just at a normal doctor checkup, that it turns out you only have five to 10 years left to live, what would you change about your life? And then the last question I ask is if you went to the doctor for a routine checkup, and you found out that you only have 24 hours left to live, looking, thinking about the finality of that moment, what did you miss? What did you never get to experience or do or become or see? And I was reading our notes of the responses to those questions and subsequent converse, conversations we've had over the years. And when we had that conversation initially in the following five years of talking with them regularly, I never would have thought that that was real for them. And um, that is very, in my mind, like that can happen. That's real. Um, yeah. So I would, I would hate for you to sit here and say, Jim, this thing's really important to me. And then you don't do it. Like, man, it's really important that my kids know that I love them by the way that I spend my time, the way that I use my words, the things that I do with them and for them. It's like, okay, I want them to know that, but then they don't know it because I'm so busy working so I can buy a few hundred thousand more sats. It's like, man, that's great. I love, like, I, I, I want to have, a, I do want to have money so I can be generous and I can do those things for my family. But like, at what point do I begin sacrificing 
the things that I really value on the altar of a of success of something I don't even care about. There is a barrier. And unfortunately, a lot of people cross I cross that sometimes. I do with my time, with my money, with my relationships, I cross that line. But I hope that I am aware enough to realize, hold on, I'm doing that thing I said would derail me. So I, I mentioned earlier, we do, uh, we, we talk about values and then goals and then trade offs. Part of those trade offs is one, like, yeah, what are the things that you're going to have to trade? Like, what are the things you're going to have to give up, the decisions you're going to have to make? But also, like, what's the most probable thing of derailing what you said is important to you? And it's like, ah, we want to retire. And also, I want to make sure I have time with my kids. Like, okay, what's the most probable thing to derail you doing that? It's like, it's usually something financial and then something non financial. It's like, for me, it's like, what, Jim, what's the most probable thing for you not being able to have financial freedom at 45 and not spending time with your kids and your wife? It's like, well, I guess I did a really job, bad job saving and investing, and I probably neglected my relationships with them. Um, so just checking in there. And it's like, okay, if we know, it, it's, it's, it, we're doing what's called a pre-mortem. So a lot of times people do a post-mortem. The post-mortem is simply like, okay, what was the cause of death here? You know, a pre-mortem is if this happens, what's the most likely event that led to that, that, that event, that death or whatever. So what's the most likely event that led to this bad outcome? And if we can identify the most likely things, we can see like, hey, you're that thing that's most likely going to de derail me. I know how to navigate you because I see, I can, I saw you coming. And when we can identify, if you can, if you can identify that preemptively and say like, oh, you're that thing that's going to try to derail me. You're that thing of like, I'm spending too much money and I'm not going to be able to have the money to help my kids with my daughter's wedding, or I'm not going to be able to take my kids on this vacation, or I'm not gonna have time with my kids, or I'm not going to be able to uh, retire. Like, you know, that thing, cause you've identified it. And I think most of us know that like, I, I probably spent, I probably spent too much money. I didn't save enough, or I worked too much or I invested poorly or whatever. And if we just first come to terms with that, that it is, and you were like, all right, you're the error. Okay. Let's navigate around that. Ryan, that's, that's a really good insight. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so so much. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis I guess you already bought some Bitcoin and now the most important step is is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss Robin to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. I, I, I love, I love the story also because, uh, so, sometimes, uh, it's not, it's not, not about the financial thing, but, um, how can we avoid then the flip side of that if like okay you have a, a stack of money and and then you're like okay but I, I really want to do this i really want to do that and then after like a year you you did a, a all, all the things you wanted to do but you, you have no money left and you're like oh shit like i'm, I'm in debt or something like that so like how, how do we 
uh, now go go the other side and uh, avoid uh, just impulse buying on what we think we like or we, we maybe actually love, but <laughs> we, have, we have way more years to live than we have money left. Yeah. Um I think that can be done twofold. One, I feel like I'm a broken record and I apologize for that. But part of that is truly articulating what's important to you, but then making sure that you don't fall, fall, fall prey to the wrong side of brain side of things. It's like, okay, I want to do all these things now. And don't worry, 76 year old Jim is not really Jim. That's a stranger. It's like, no, that's really me. Hopefully, hopefully I'm 76 one day. Um, and that's really me. And I have things that are really important to me then. Am I robbing future Jim? Am I robbing future things for the sake of now and if i am just one admit it and once i've admitted it is that trade-off worth it is it worth that i buy this extra thing now but not have that thing later on okay let's say i want to be able to i want to be able to help my kids uh my daughter have a wedding and my kids buy their first house and then i want to be able to uh travel regularly to see my grandkids one day i have four kids so i'll probably have somewhere between eight and 16 grandkids would be my guess in like the next 30 years. If I'm still working in 30 years, you know, in 30 years, I'll only, I'll only be 64. So if in 30 years I'm still working and there's nothing wrong with working in your sixties, but if I am, I won't be able to be there as much with my grandkids. So right now, is it more important that I have do whatever my money today or that I'm able to be there with my grandkids later on? make that decision. You are choosing those things. Yes, of course, there's sometimes not choices. It's like, dude, I, I've, I was born in poverty and I live in a third world country. I can't have the, I don't have the ability to make a decision to save a lot of money for the future. It's like, okay, I recognize that. Um, um, but most people are in that decision, in that place. But if you, so you have that ability, just know, like you are making a decision. You are casting a vote both now and down the line with what's important to you. I, I love that casting a vote also because I think every financial decision is a vote for 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 something. Yeah, really cool. By the way, I, I looked it up while you're saying it. Uh, Jeff Bezos also, funny enough, has four kids, uh, just like you. <laughs> I, I, I want. I'm curious uh, not to dig into Jeff's life. But I'm curious the relationship with his kids. Like, I mean, I, I don't I don't know how old his kids were when they got divorced. I know if if Kendra and I got a divorce right now, that would be really hard on my kids. If we got divorced when my kids were 30, that'd be really hard on my kids. Um, so if you said, Jim, you'll be a billionaire, but uh, you're gonna, you're, you and your wife, you're separated and your relationship with your kids is not the same. Like, I don't care about the money. Um, and that's a decision. That's a decision you have to face every day. How are you going to, how are you going to spend it? Interesting. Um, it's really interesting also that you have as a financial planner, the inside in the, in the fiat world, and you have a lot of colleagues, uh, that probably, as you said, don't like fiat and uh, don't like Bitcoin. And they're like, uh, why are you doing it if, if Bitcoin, um, how do you think, uh, will Bitcoin impact personal finances and these decisions as you have? Uh, you said your, all your clients have Bitcoin uh, and uh, you see it with your other colleagues. They have probably a lot of clients who don't have Bitcoin uh, as they don't like, as the financial planner don't, doesn't like it. Is there a difference uh, in, in the decision making in the personal financials or is Bitcoin just a tool of money and doesn't really change a lot in the behaviors? Hmm. That's an interesting convers uh, question. Um, I would say once you grasp Bitcoin, it does at least change beyond it's a separate allocation. Once you truly understand Bitcoin, at minimal, it's going to change how you view our money system and our debt system overall. So suddenly, again, you can allocate 3% to Bitcoin and not really know what it is. You're just doing it because like, you know, historically, I would have made more money. You know, but you don't understand what Bitcoin is. Uh, but once you really grasp what Bitcoin is, you start realizing like, wow, our, our whole money system is outrageously broken. Our debt system is crazy broken. There's monetary premium in like every asset out there. So then you start thinking through like, okay, this isn't just I can outperform the S&P by a few percent and add a little bit extra to my Kager or something like that. It's all right. This is a not a subversion. Um, this is a means of opting out of our totally broken money system. So I will think you, you minimally will change in that capacity. Um, which is interesting because yeah, I, t again, I take a lot of flack from the financial planning community about this stuff. And I would say that the problem is, 
And this is sort of like Jesse. Uh, do you know Jesse Myers, Cretius? Uh, Jesse, his article on uh, an oldie but a goodie, uh, Bitcoin uh, and the yuppie elite. Uh, so I see that a lot with financial planners. So a lot of financial planners dismiss Bitcoin. And they're, they're a, a, a big problem they have is they're really good or a good financial planner is really good at managing things around your money. They're great with tax planning and managing uh, equity compensation and estate planning, navigation with your money and retirements and all these things. They're good with managing your money. But very few financial planners have stopped to ask, but what is money? And if you live around money all the time, stopping and asking what is money sounds like a really foolish thing to say. But until you ask what is money, there's no way for you to recognize that our money system's broken. And until you recognize that, you think that Bitcoin is a proposed solution to a non-issue. And that is where most financial planners have a hard time adopting it. Um, so, but once you go there, like with clients and everything, like once you go with like, oh, Bitcoin's money and it's better money. And this money that we've been served and this thing that we're familiar with is a broken system. Then it's like, all right, this is, again, this is not just something you tack on. This becomes like the underlying thesis of our, 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 our money in that sense. Mm, I love it a lot. Not an obvious question. Uh, what is money for you and why is, is Bitcoin the, the perfect one? Uh, so my, my, my definition of money would be money. Money is a means of communicating, storing, and transferring value across space and time. So again, money communicates value. If I use my money for one thing, if it's to put a roof over our head, I'm saying that's important that we have a roof over our head. If it's to uh, buy my child a gift that he really wants, I'm communicating that, hey, you having that thing is important to me. So it's a means of communication. Um, but it's also a means of storing and transferring value across space and time. And obviously, I think, you know, Bitcoin is superior to storing value compared to US dollars or the euro or, or the S&P 500, you know, that has a monetary premium. Um, so in my opinion, it's a better form of money for storing value uh, and also transferring value across, again, time. There's the storage part there, but also uh, space. Uh, sending, you know, sending Bitcoin is much simpler uh, than sending uh, a wire transfer, especially when we get to uh, the uh, the possibility of uh, confiscation of assets based off of I ate too much beef or, you know, the conspiracy conspiracy theory types things uh, that I think are inevitable um, one day that the, the Bitcoin is superior for. So I would say in, in every way, Bitcoin is superior money. Um, not just an, another asset you should tack on to a portfolio. As it's, it's, it's super interesting for me. Yeah. It's, it's maybe, maybe personal finance because <laughs> I, I've done uh, all the stocks. I have done like the, the diversification game. Uh, but <laughs> since I am in Bitcoin, I'm just all in, in Bitcoin. Is, is that a stupid idea? I mean, I'm, I'm 26, but uh, <laughs> would you say that it's a, it's a stupid idea for me being just all in Bitcoin? Like I, I told that on the, on the podcast, I think two, three times already, but uh, just for you as context, I basically have everything in Bitcoin. I have a personal fiat account, which has a $10,000 uh, limit. Uh, and I just try to keep it at zero. So if I have an unexpected expense, uh, I just pay from, from the debt. Then the next time something comes up, I go to zero again. If I have a little bit too much, then I buy Bitcoin with that. So <laughs> I just try to keep zero fiat and I have everything in Bitcoin. You, you said emergency fund in, uh, in, in, in uh, US dollar or fiat. When does it make sense? for me actually to consider oh i should have an emergency fund uh and and why does it make sense or, or um, am i stupid for that <laughs> no there, there's a lot of things that feed into that so I, I wrote a paper i don't know probably two months ago that that helps me sort of triage the question of how much bitcoin should i own or what allocation should i have to bitcoin and it's this again it's like this this uh flow chart in my head of like when you'll need it, what you'll use it for, your risk tolerance, your risk capacity, your age, your other assets, uh, expected windfalls, unusual assets, your your cash flow, your expected future cash flow and savings rates. Like all these things feed into it. Like if you're um, – a very simplistic way of looking at this is let's say you had $1,000 today and you have to have $1,000 tomorrow because um, you need to go – buy an let's say you you wanted to buy an engagement ring okay I, I don't know if you're married or not let's say you need to go buy an engagement ring and you're going to propose on saturday and you're buying the ring on friday and the ring costs a thousand bucks okay um and if you don't have a ring you can't propose let's just stick with me here 
Um, so let's say that's the case. It would be crazy for you to go buy Bitcoin with a thousand. If you had a thousand dollars cash today, it'd be crazy to go buy Bitcoin, hoping that Bitcoin goes up 5%. And now you have a thousand fifty bucks because if Bitcoin goes down by 5%, you can no longer buy that ring and you no longer can propose to your girlfriend than would be fiance. So in that sense, the thing that determines should you own Bitcoin versus versus fiat is, well, I need this money very short term. What is my risk? Not your tolerance. Maybe your risk tolerance, the, the amount of volatility you can stomach would say, yeah, I can have full Bitcoin, but your risk capacity, your actual ability to absorb the risk of that volatility um, is not, is not uh, suitable for that allocation. So it's time frame, uh, capacity, not just tolerance. A lot of Bitcoiners have a very high risk tolerance, and I, I'm all for that. I'm, that's totally fine. Um, but assessing risk capacity, your expected liquidity needs, your savings rate. If you said, well, yeah, but Jim, tomorrow I'll get another $1,000. Well, it's like, okay, well, then your your expected future savings uh, would be able to replace that. So I guess you could put it all in Bitcoin because it doesn't matter because tomorrow you'll have that. Um, so there, there's lots of factors. I mean, personally, I I mean, I'm I'm 34. Um, and then, yeah, Kendra and I, like, that's basically all we own. I own, I own my business. Um, I own Bitcoin and I own a couple of stocks. And it just happens to be that those stocks right now are basically all like Bitcoin adjacent companies as well. Like that's what I own. And whenever I have excess, excess money, my decision is basically, do I put more money in the business to hire, to scale, to invest in there, or do I buy more Bitcoin with it? Like that's, that's basically where I'm putting our money. Um, and I'm fine with that. But the thing is like, I mean, personally, I own a business and the business is if, if you're a business owner and you're a good business owner, you should be building not just a job, but an asset that you can one day sell that you, most businesses ideally. So my business, I am building as an asset that I think will do really well. If I had a W2 job that was not this asset I could sell, I literally have one less asset. So like personally, despite having basically all of my net worth, liquid net worth in Bitcoin, I still own this asset that is not Bitcoin. So I am, in reality, I'm 50% allocated to Bitcoin. Um, so there's those situations. Or maybe uh, maybe you're 64 and you have elderly parents and you know that your, your dad has a life insurance policy for a million bucks and he's 86 and has cancer. And he'll probably he'll pass away in the next six months. Well, if we knew that, and maybe you have a million dollars invested assets. So you're 64. You have a million bucks of investment assets. You know without a fact or without a doubt, you're going to get another million dollars in the next couple of years. Um, and it's in a life insurance policy. Okay. Well, if you know that's going to happen and that million dollars is a life insurance policy right now, that's basically like sitting on a million dollars that's in cash. So I would, to an extent, maybe you should discount this based off of your likelihood and probability and like when you expect to get that. But if you're sitting on a million dollars in literal cash, you would offset that allocation by going to a higher allocation, something more aggressive. So again, that I would, that's another triage opportunity is, am I expecting a windfall from something and at, at what point and what likelihood do I want to sign that thing to happening? And that will also determine um, how much should you have. So um, I am, most people would, would say I am sort of nuts. I mean, Bitcoiners would say that maybe I'm conservative. Um, maybe, I don't know. Um, but um, yeah, I think... That's a big question that has to take in like a zillion considerations. But no, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think you're crazy. I don't know. You're, you said you're 26. Are you married, single? Like, do you have any big yeah, expenses yeah. on the horizon? Like there's, there's those types of things you have to navigate. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that, that's the thing. Like I, first of all, I'm a little bit calm because half of my Bitcoin or one third of my Bitcoin, something like that, uh, is uh, not taxable because of the tax law in, in, in Austria because I bought them before they became taxable. Now all, all Bitcoin that uh, I think that's, that makes me a little bit calmer because I can actually sell them without having a huge tax bill. Uh, and I have no um, really big um, expenses that I expect anytime soon. Uh, that that that's what comes me down. But yeah, um, I'm a little bit more conservative already because, like a few years ago, a few years like two years ago, I was even on leverage. I, I put like this 110, 115 percent. I got down from that uh, because now I'm self-employed. Now I'm completely on on my own. So probably. Uh, as the 
responsibility grows and uh, me and my girlfriend maybe are married and maybe have kids one day or my business is not just me or maybe some, there are some employees, then obviously uh, there are unexpected things. If it's just yourself, uh, it's it's easy to, to know what's going on. But if there are, if there are kids involved or employees involved, then I, uh, then the the thing grows, the, the demand for, for an emergency fund, a rainy day fund, it's, it's way, way bigger in my opinion. Dude, if I if I was a single guy in 26, I would probably be living in a like a, a van like in the mountains somewhere, and my cost of living would be nothing. Um, and it's like, yeah, I could put everything into Bitcoin, and like, what's the worst thing that's gonna happen? Like, you're not gonna repo my van. Um, like that's it. So it, you know, there's these there's lots of factors to consider here. And heck, even if you do own other assets, what are those assets in? You know, like let's say I don't know what you would assign as the most likely event to make Bitcoin go down by eighty percent at this moment. But let's say that eighty percent drop of Bitcoin would be catastrophic to your situation. So you own other assets. But let's say the most let's say you would think the most likely event for a massive bitcoin drop would be a macro uh, a, a an adverse macroeconomic event okay well theoretically in that situation if you're diversified by owning the s&p the s&p in that probably in that situation would also drop drastically so what other thing do you own to diversify out of bitcoin and at what what role is that trying to play are you trying to hedge against this big macro event you probably shouldn't own I don't know, um, an equivalent type of asset. Like, I'm not saying you should go buy a bunch of like long duration bonds, but like, what is your, what is the uh, other side of that barbell? If you said, Jim, I do need to own something that's not Bitcoin. Again, like, what are you, what are you, what are you throwing in there to offset risk? And again, you have to start, a, you have to assess like, what are risks? Uh, what's the risk to my portfolio? And how do I allocate around this thing? And that could be, I don't know, like, Personally, I think a, a way that you could do that is by like buying like value funds or deep value or or commodities or again like a, there's a lot of ways you go about this. Uh, it depends on what you what you define as risk and assess for a proper hedge. I love that a lot. Yeah, this this episode is really good already. I, I love it. One. Um topic uh, one avenue i really want to go into because i know it's extremely popular uh just from the data i get from the from the um, from the podcast is retiring on bitcoin and i had i think like at least like 10 episodes around that but uh, I've, I've not 100 percent like there are a lot of oh, all those calculators where you can put in like when do you start withdrawal like what's your living expenses all that stuff like there's a lot of Axel magic <laughs> happening with, with retri retiring on uh, retiring on something, but how do you go ahead if you're like okay you're in a job yeah. that you don't really hate but you're also not really satisfied with it and uh, you don't let's say you don't have a way out uh, probably you have a way out but let's say for the argument's sake you don't have a way out how do you go ahead and say like oh how do I actually ca uh, calculate how many Bitcoin I need to retire what what do I have to need uh, to take in concept but like how do you look at that topic that's probably currently the hardest question that i'm routinely asked um because usually when i'm asked that question it comes from someone with deep conviction who says that thinks that, that number is super low um what i mean by that is and i'll see people write i see this on like twitter all the time um and if you're that person i'm not hating on you i'm just saying it's an observation i have is i'll see people tweeting that you only need half a Bitcoin to be in the top percent of the people in the world and you could retire off half a Bitcoin. And they, that's, that's the tweet. But then two days later, they'll tweet something of like, I'll never have enough Bitcoin and like keep stacking. It's like, okay, which one is it? And the problem is that a lot of people come to me who are really convicted of Bitcoin and they want to know how much Bitcoin do I have to have? And they come to me with some sort of narrative in their head that two Bitcoin is enough to retire. But it's like, dude, when are we talking about? Like two Bitcoin was not enough to retire two years ago. A hundred Bitcoin was not enough to retire a decade ago. It's enough to retire today if Bitcoin keeps doing what you think you'll do. If Bitcoin drops to a dollar again, it's not enough to retire. You know, like theoretically, let's say it happens. Like, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, but the point being, when will it be used? So a large issue is people throw out uh, statements without qualifying them enough. I am I try to be very measured with my words. So I'm not going to say you need two Bitcoin to retire because 
if you retire today with two Bitcoin, that's US dollar equivalent at this moment, because what's really important, we're not looking at a dollar equivalent, we're looking at purchasing power. But to simpl simplify purchasing power, the dollar equivalent is used. So right now, two Bitcoin is what, $135,000 roughly? Like if Bitcoin, let's say Bitcoin doubles in the next year, okay? Just theoretically, the Bitcoin doubles the next year, but I spend 150 grand per year, all right? Well, between now and when that's doubled, I'm spending, what, uh, 12 and change per month? So I have not given my two Bitcoin enough time to grow in that time. So I just ate most of my seed, okay? Now let's say we get to in that phase and now I have 1.2 Bitcoin. And that 1.2 Bitcoin is now worth, again, we're back to it of like, I have 1.2 Bitcoin, it doubled. So let's call it 130,000. So uh, uh, was that 1326, $156,000. So I have roughly where I'm at right now. Well, if Bitcoin does again the next year, what we think it will do, like, all right, I'm still eating the seed that I need. But if Bitcoin drops to by 20%, let's say, well, suddenly that little I ran out of I ran out of money after like, what, two, maybe three years. Um, so you are. I don't know, my brain works in bad analogies. It's like if you were a farmer, it's like, Jim, how many seeds do I have to buy in order to make an orchard? One question is, at what point will you, when were you going to take those seeds that the trees produce and plant more trees versus at what point are you going to start eating this, the, uh, the fruit that, 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 that those trees provide and no longer planting anymore? Um, because if I, if I plant a seed and then I'm greedy and I need to eat that seed right now, I don't have enough time for that seed to grow and produce more and more. And that's, that's a risk of saying you only need two Bitcoin to retire. Again, it's the same risk of saying a, a, a decade ago, you only need 100 Bitcoin to retire. Um, I just said lots of words without answering your question. Um, I will say this. <laughs> um, I, I wrote, I did, again, when I was writing that paper a few months back around like thoughts through allocating to Bitcoin, um, I did do some math in the background. Um, I did not publish this because I don't want like compliance and SEC people breathing down my neck. But I did do a lot of math to see like, well, roughly what allocation would you need in order to sustain your per your real purchasing power of a portfolio um, if you replace it with Bitcoin? And this is not a guarantee. This is not investment advice. This is not tax legal advice. All the disclosures, okay? Um, but in my, in my thought and research in that, if you had roughly in today's today's date, again, this, this number is going to change. But at today, if you had roughly 4% of your portfolio of investable assets in Bitcoin, if Bitcoin does what I and I think you would think it will do, that over time would allow your, your real purchasing power to stay flat. Therefore, if you had greater than 4%, it would go up in theory. And if you had less than 4%, it would go down. How I came to that conclusion is assigning monetary premiums two of those other assets and the probability of the monetary premium being sucked out and assigned to Bitcoin. So like if Bitcoin does what we think it will do in that situation, the value of Bitcoin has to go up. The real value of Bitcoin has to go up to the detriment of other assets. Now you can see the nominal value of those assets go up. So if the, if the U S prints a bazillion dollars, and stocks and real estate and gold and bonds all go up a bunch, um, and your Bitcoin goes up along with it, you look like you have more money, but you've lost purchasing power, okay? Especially against Bitcoin, all right? So in real terms, Bitcoin has to go up to the detriment of the other's assets. And again, that's where, like, if it if if Bitcoin sucks out the monetary pre premium of the S&P 500 and your bond fund and your real estate holdings, um, and you have less than, again, my, my thought here is if you have less than 4%, too much value is going to be sucked out of your other assets assigned to Bitcoin. You don't own enough Bitcoin to, to capture that real rise there. Therefore, you are, in, you are the net negative of value retention. 4% um, right now would be my guess of sustained. Greater than that would be the growth. Again, not advice. That's just my personal research. I don't know how to disclose anything else. Don't take that as investment advice talk to an attorney and tax advisor and investor advisor. <laughs> you can just let, let like a black screen with a, lot, a bunch of disclaimers run over the screen. <laughs> I didn't, yeah, I didn't publish those numbers in that research because I didn't want to just get raked over the coals by everyone out there who's like, oh, that guy said a number. It's like, dude, can I not have an, a thought? Um, so 
anyways, yeah, that, 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 that's why that's where I came to my, my my thought is. And that's all obviously that's running assumptions that Bitcoin will do what I think it'll do. And that that will come at the monetary premium removal and all these things. Um, but that that's the closest I can get to an answer. Now, personally, I have a lot more Bitcoin than obviously I told you earlier, I have a lot more Bitcoin than 4%. And, and uh, our clients basically have uh, a lot more than that, too. Um, to the point that a lot of people think it's crazy. I, again, like I said earlier, like most financial planners think I'm really stupid. I think they're really wrong. I don't think you, I don't care if you think I'm stupid. If I think you're wrong, like I think you're you're thinking I'm stupid from an unfound basis, and I really don't care. Um, so that's where we are. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine like a financial planner con uh, conference where you are the one like, hey, Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, I purposely really, I love it. Uh, I mean, day to day, I, I come to my office right down the street from my house. And like today, I'm actually dressed up pretty nice. I'm wearing some jeans, but usually I'm wearing like a swimsuit t shirt and my sandals. Um, pretty chill. Um, you know, I'm trying to get dressed in the morning with four kids hanging off me. Like, I'm not going to get put a suit on. Um, uh, but yeah, I purposely like when I go to like Bitcoin conferences or things like that, I try to always wear like a Bitcoin shirt just to uh, I like to be that sore thumb. It's fun. Um, I've always I've always wanted to be like a closet genius. You know, the movie Good Goodwill Hunting. I've always wanted to be like Will, like a closet genius. The problem is I'm not a genius. So the closest I can get is being a closet sort of smart guy. Um, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I like I like going to like, yeah, financial planning, like things and uh uh trying not that i'm trying to ruffle feathers but i would love like what frustrates me about financial planners who don't understand bitcoin and don't talk to their clients about it is they trust you with their money like you're not impacting yourself you're impacting a hundred or a thousand families um and that's frustrating especially like there's people i talk to it's like oh yeah our clients are 80 percent long bonds and hey the the yield curves fall in so our bonds are gonna do really well it's like dude like what are you doing um that makes me mad because again they're dealing with like you really you start thinking of this who they're who they're working with you put a face to it uh i mean I, that's why i get riled up when it comes like inflation like inflation's frustrating but then you think of the cancel on effect and you think through like who benefits and then you picture the old lady at the grocery store whose husband died 20 years ago and now she lives off her deceased husband's pension and when he died, it was 2000 bucks. And today it's still 2000 bucks. So there's no cost of living adjustment. And she used to be able to be fine on that. And now she's about to get evicted. And she's only eating one meal a day because she's on the wrong end of the cancel on effect. Like that's when you, you put a face to this. You tell, you actually bring it. You're not making up stories. This stuff is real. And when you do that, it's like, okay, this is why this is important. Um, and I've talked to these people. I've talked to a ton of people about their money. Um, yeah, it's 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 real, and that's that's I am very motivated uh, because of these things. Why why do those uh, financial planners uh, don't don't get it? Do they have to unlearn more of of, of the fear? Like, uh, why do they don't question what is what is money? As you said before, I think it's the yeah, it's the, well, it's the they don't question what is money, and I think that comes from I don't know. Like, why does, do, well, not that fish, maybe fish do ask, like, does a fish ask what is water? You know, I don't, I don't know. Like, can they think about that even, but let's just say they could do fish ask what is water. Um, and I think that's what the problem is. A lot of financial advisors live in water and therefore that's not, they're not going to ask, what is it? I've always been, uh, um, I was a, I was a terrible student through college, really bad. Like I had a two, six GPA, I think. My wife had a 4.0 in high school and college. And a few years ago, she had to go get my GPA for something. And uh, she had to go pick it up. And I said, hey, babe, when they give it to you, please don't make fun of me. Um, like, And also, just don't think I'm a total moron, please. And she was like, what is it? I was like, it's just embarrassing. She's like, what is it like a 3.6? I was like, man, if, you, if that's embarrassing, you're going to think you married a total moron. Um, I was just a really bad student. And what I realized after college and everything, once I started like finding what I like in, in finance is I'm actually a really good student, but I have to sit on the front row and I have to ask the dumb questions. That's what I've realized. I've, I want to be smart. I don't want to, I don't care if I appear to be smart. I want to be smart. I don't care if I appear to be stupid as long as I'm not no longer stupid. And I think a lot of people won't do that. So I'm the guy when a question, when something's going on in a lecture and it's like, man, I definitely should know what he's saying, but I definitely don't. And if he continues on, I'm not going to make it through this class at all. I'd rather raise my hand and ask the dumb question like, hey, what's water? And it's like, ah, that guy's an idiot. I know there's like nine other people in the classroom who are wanting the same thing. And that's where we are in finance. No one, no, one wants, no one wants to ask the dumb question of what's money. 
you look like an idiot. It's like, well, I'd rather look like an idiot than actually be one. Um, and I think that's where like Bitcoiners are come like, well, what is it? I'm okay to like, you know, look like a fool and ask the simple questions. I, I wish I'd have known this back in college. Like I took macroeconomics and, and, and microeconomics. None of that stuff made sense to me. It's, it's because they taught Keynesian economics. I wish I'd have raised my hands and said, hey, this doesn't make sense. But I was afraid to say that because I thought maybe it's the o- I'm the only one it didn't make sense for. Well, it's because I didn't have a radar that like, no, it, it truly doesn't make sense. And if I, if I would have pressed them on that, your view of economics doesn't make sense. Maybe it's because I'm stupid or maybe it's because it's broken. At least they would have had to articulate to me why it's not broken when, you know, Keynes and economics is. Um, but I was afraid of looking foolish. Um, and now it's like, I'll look like a fool all day. I don't care as long as I'm not one. Um, so I think it's that. Maybe. Maybe there's a lot smarter than I am and I'm missing everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's funny. Man. Sometimes you... Uh, <laughs> I, I have those moments. Like, if you have a daily Bitcoin podcast, it's really hard to not be super bullish on Bitcoin. Like, you you, you, you talk with a bullish Bitcoin every day and you're like, oh shit, like, I have a real FOMO here. Like, <laughs> I have to get to more Bitcoin. It's 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 contagious, definitely. So, But, but sometimes I'm like... Maybe, maybe we are actually the foolish one. Like maybe our small group is wrong, but but I don't think so. I definitely don't think so. And we are getting uh, big, big with every day. And I f- do think so that financial planners who don't have a Bitcoin strategy at, at some point will look foolish. Like they're like, why, why didn't you tell me five years ago of Bitcoin? So I think like financial planners should um, uh, save their face and, and learn about Bitcoin. And now like it's so obvious now. I feel like. Dude, I, I think you are breaching your fiduciary duty. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as say if all of your clients don't own Bitcoin, I'm not going to say that you're breaching your financial fiduciary duty. But if you can't at minimum give a good reason why they shouldn't own Bitcoin. And I, when I say good reason, it's not because it's Beanie Babies or because whatever. Give a good reason. And if you can't do that, you're speaking to something you don't understand. You need to at least admit that. So if they ask, hey, why don't I own Bitcoin? Just say, I don't understand it. Say that. But there's lack of honesty there. It's like, obviously, no one's going to, most people don't admit that. They think they understand it. They think that it's, they, 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 think it, they think it's Beanie Babies or Tulips, but that's because it's coming from a place of lack, of lack of education. You know, if someone asks me about something I don't understand, there's a lot of them. Um, I'll say, I don't know, but I'll do my best to get you an answer real quick. Let me go check around. And I'll ask someone who's way smarter than me, than me in that area. I'm not going to say, oh, well, you shouldn't do that thing and I'll just make something up like that'd be nuts of me to do but that happens all the time in Bitcoin um yeah and I think that's really wrong and will become apparent that it's really wrong in the future absolutely and I think uh, we we have to get to a point where it's normal to say uh, oh I have to research uh, oh I did not build an opinion on that like I think like uh, not even like financial banner but like in general uh, we we when there's a topic discussed and and for example like a war uh, it's <laughs> I brought it up before in a podcast, but I think it's really uh, a suiting um, on a family table or, or some friend's table and they, they talk about the Ukraine and Russia war. I'm the one saying like, I have no clue about that. And I didn't do any research on that war whatsoever. And people call me crazy. Like, how can you not have an opinion? Like, I don't like I, I didn't do any research. I have no clue what's going on. I didn't I don't know. I know there's Putin. I don't I know there's Zelensky, but that that's my knowledge of the war and I have no clue about it. And it's okay for me to admit that. Uh and because I have no knowledge, like I'm not willing to have an opinion on that because that would be foolish of me, even on that subject. So I think uh, we, we have to get a po- to a point where it's okay to say, I don't know. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And it's then it's willing to say like, well, is that important enough for some to be something that I should learn about? Or is it not like I don't know how I don't know how most things at my house work. Like, I have no clue. I don't know how the heck I'm seeing you right now. Like, I don't know how I'm seeing you and you're seeing me and we're talking together. No clue. Do I need to know? Eh, not really. Um, so what is important enough for me to say, like, I need to know that. Um, and if I don't know, it would be really, like you said, it'd be foolish for me to chime in. I think it's a big problem. I mean, it's all, I think it's always been a problem. That's why like gossip and all that stuff is not something new. It's just, it's, you know, millennia old. Um, 
but like obviously it's just amplified on social media everyone has an opinion about everything even if it's something that you have no clue what you're talking about because it's better to have an opinion than it is to not uh supposedly it's like dude you're 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 just saying things that you have zero education on that's a frustrating thing like in the u.s here it's like yes i'm all this man it's gonna sound bad if i should say it like um i think yes everyone should be able to vote you know whatever that, that's a that's a right that we have in the u.s but man it's pretty frustrating when some absolute goober who has no clue about anything has the same weighting of a vote that i have not that i have everything figured out but man there are some people that's like man you can vote um and it has the same weight as me and maybe that's something like i shouldn't be able to go into a a tech convention and decide how this piece of technology is built and have the same weight as satoshi like he knows more than me i'd say i'm gonna advocate bow out of my thing and say with his and maybe i should have a voice on how something is done or what it has in it or whatever but like i probably shouldn't chime in um now i guess they could come with a lot of flags like jim's saying that not everyone should be able to vote and you have to be like him and you have to have everyone needs to agree with me it's like no that's not my time to say it's like I just recognize that I probably shouldn't talk about certain things. Um, and yes, like maybe it, there's a lot of stuff. I, 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 there's a lot of things I don't have an opinion on. It's like, I need to go learn more about that before I can have an opinion. Um, and that's where a lot of, I guess it goes back to the whole Bitcoin things. People have a lot, people have really strong opinions about something they know, know nothing about. Um, and that's, that's the dangerous part is uh, deep conviction without deep education. Uh, when proper education builds proper conviction. Um, people put the cart in front of the horse. Um, unfortunately they get, and that that's called hype or fear. Um, and hype can come when you have deep conviction that you don't want on something you don't understand. And that's why you have these big boom and bust cycles with crypto. That's hype driven, not conviction driven and conviction driven would be, would be built on education. Um, but that's also why you have a new high of a low is because each having cycle, you have a new educated base that's building up. So education builds conviction, which builds strong hands. And unfortunately, there's just too much hype, which is the antithesis of education. Um, it, and again, that, that, that lack of education and those, those, those actions, strong actions without education uh, can be very dangerous, both from a hype perspective or from a fear perspective. Oh, the sky is falling. It's like, dude, no, you, you don't understand what's happening here. Um, so it, it can go both ways. Oh, that's yeah, a lot that's of rambling. So that, that, uh, that latte hit, and now I'm just talking. <laughs> I, I love it. It's really cool. Uh, unfortunately, we are already kind of in the in the end scene of the of the podcast. Um, really interesting question. I have always for my guest that is always the same question for each guest. I model it a little bit. Uh, instead of Bitcoin, I use the word finances for you. What can we learn from you besides finances? Mm. It goes back to I don't know that many things. Um, I would say one, going back to what do you value and helping go back to that. That's easy to lose track of and lose sight of. Um, so try to, try to glean that. Maybe you're doing a great job. That's fantastic. At least be reminded of it. Um, yeah. What do you value? Um, and, uh, thinking through things deeper. So like this whole Bitcoin rabbit hole. I think, unfortunately, a lot of people uh, are go down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin and think they arrive at deep truth and the deepest truth possible. Um, but I, I think that's a shame to think that you found the ultimate truth because you found Bitcoin, which is just a better form of money. So, um, yeah, I would I would I would say that 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 is something you should should dig into some more. Absolutely. Really cool. Um, we have an entertain in the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. And your question from the previous guest is what has been the biggest impact of Bitcoin in your life? I was curious what my question would be. Um, probably that I'm just flipping rich now. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> like what? <laughs> um, the biggest impact of Bitcoin in my life. Ah, man. I don't know. I, I, I talk about Bitcoin a ton, um, both professionally and personally, uh, so many relationships and, uh, I don't want to start saying things. So the biggest, if I had to distill it down to one thing, the biggest, I mean, frankly, it's probably both my personal financial life. And then the, the, again, I, I have the, in the, the honored invitation 
to speak into deeply into a lot of people's lives financially and the ability to bring Bitcoin to them is amazing. Um, so it's not just my personal financial side of things. It's okay. I understand this and I can now usher that into other people and help them understand Bitcoin and how it can fit into their financial life as well. Um, it's pretty big because I'd be doing, I'd be working with people financially anyways. Uh, and I think I do a lot better job because of that now. I love that. I re really love that. Really cool. Perfect. Uh, then uh, before I let you go, where can people find you, ask you questions, reach out to you? Uh, my my Twitter is Jim Kreider TX, uh, as in Texas. So at Jim Kreider TX, or I guess my X is that. Uh, um, and then, I mean, my my website, it's intentional living FP, as in financial planning, intentional living FP.com. Um, my calendar's right on the home screen. If you want to throw them in on my calendar, I'm happy to just have like a super random question or whatever, more than happy to, to, to riff with you and answer any questions I can. Super cool. Thank you so much, uh, Jim, for being on my show. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is joining us today uh, for, for, for being with us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.